And uh, we'll start with um, Samuel Mullins, yep. uh, Ohio Department of Agriculture. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, I'm gonna go through, this presentation normally takes me about an hour. So I'm going through it in about 20 minutes. Uh, bear with me, I will stick around for questions and whatnot. Uh, today I'm just doing an overview of o Ohio Department of Agriculture's Division of Livestock Environmental Permitting, from here on known as DLEP. So I will say DLEP from time to time. Uh, we've got a staff of nine people, uh, three engineers, four inspectors, myself and our uh, uh, program administrator. Uh, this is the area that our inspectors cover. Uh, these are arbitrary boundaries. They, they are more, um, I, I guess not arbitrary, but they, they are kind of formed around where our concentration of, of, of animals and uh, particularly permitted facilities are at. Um, any county that is shaded in, in multiple colors, that just means we have two inspectors in that county. That does not mean that's that, their exact boundary, but you can see we, we've got about three inspectors that cover, well, we do have three inspectors that cover the western part of the state and one that covers the eastern part of the state. Uh, I will refer from time to time back to our uh, statute and our administrative rules, um, Ohio Revised Code 903. Uh, just Google o ORC 903 if you want to dive into uh, our, our statute, and OAC 90110 if you want to dive into our rules. Uh, each document will take, I don't know, three or four hours to go through each. Uh, so here is when I talk about permitted facilities, okay, I am talking about livestock facilities that you guys may understand as CAFOs. Um, in, in the state of Ohio, we call them large concentrated animal feeding facilities. The, way, the reason that we designate between the two is a CAF. This is a state-issued program. Okay? We are issuing permits that are state-specific. We are not tied to uh, any federal requirement at this point. Um, so uh, the, the term CAF we had to make that designation because a CAFO technically has different sets of uh, permitting principles to it. Uh, one thing I wanted to know is a, a major concentrated animal feeding facility. This is also unique to Ohio. That is a facility that is 10 times the size uh, of this minimum threshold here. So if, if, a, if a dairy facility had 7,000 mature dairy cows, we would have, they would have a specific MCAF permit. Currently have 278 facilities across the state of Ohio. Uh, dairy, beef, horses, and turkeys have pretty much stayed, they plateaued uh, for the last couple of years. We have had some attrition with dairies, uh, either going, um, selling and changing the, num the number of animals they have, or maybe it was a, a, a dairy facility that had a, a thousand uh, mature cows and they've switched over to a thousand heifers. Uh, and that would um, require some changes to their permit. But we have seen a steady increase in poultry and a steady increase in swines, particularly over the last five years. Um, and that trend is, is going to continue to go up here in Ohio. 22 MCAFs are all larger poultry facilities. Here's our distribution throughout the state overlaying uh, where the inspector regions are at. So you can see uh, Dark, Mercer, uh, Paulding, Van Wert counties, that's where we have a high concentration of, of facilities. And that's, that's why you can kind of see why we have two inspectors covering those, those counties. And you, you can see Southern Ohio, both on the Eastern side and on the Western side, uh, geographically, it's just not conducive for a larger livestock facility. There's less land available for manure application and management. And, and, and of course, in parts of Ohio, we're getting into Appalachia. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the uh, different types of permits that we issue. The first, first type that I'm covering is a permit to install. Essentially is any facility that is constructing above that minimum permit number that I showed earlier, they have, to, they have to have a permit to install. We have the opportunity to review all the engineering principles of the manure storage. That's our primary focus, uh, but we are, all, are also looking at siting of uh, where that storage is gonna be, uh, design specifications, things of that nature. Uh, one thing and one topic I could spend so much time on is the geological evaluation. We need to know what's going on underneath those structures. Uh, we, we get a plethora of information from soil borings or soil test pits, uh, well logs that are required at, for every well that's put in Ohio. Uh, it, it's just invaluable information that we, we use for determining whether or not a structure needs to have additional engineering controls or anything of that nature. 
PTIs also give us the authority to conduct construction quality control inspections. Uh, our engineers do go on site during construction to, uh, during major parts of any construction project. For example, if it's a swine facility with a deep pit concrete, we'll be on site during that pour or shortly thereafter to inspect for uh, any deformities, cracks, or any other issues that we might, might find. The next permit is a permit to operate. It's exactly what it sounds like. If you're going to operate a facility of that size, you have to have a permit to operate. In the permit to operate, and I will just touch briefly on manure management and operating records given the time that we have, uh, but the manure management plan is by far the most intense and the most important. We have to ensure that these facilities have a balanced nutrient budget. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, out of 10, actually probably more close to 9.99 times out of 10, our, our limiting factor in our manure management plan for, from a nutrient perspective is gonna be phosphorus. Other parts of the uh, permit to operate, again, this is unique to Ohio, especially the insect and rodent control plan. Uh, you know, can't be generating flies, beetles. Uh, you, you cannot be impacting your, your neighbors with insects that are generated at your facility. Mortality management, emergency response, and operating records. I'm just gonna to touch briefly again on operating records as well. Uh, for the manure management plan, we identify everything that that facility has to inspect. Land application equipment, where manure is stored. Uh, depending on the type of manure, if it's liquid, they have to do weekly level inspections and weekly uh, structural integrity inspections. And they have to document that for us. Manure application, you know, same thing. Their equipment has to be calibrated at least annually. We need to ensure that whatever you're applying you're, is, is exactly what you say you're applying. And then in terms of land application, you know, we, these manure management plans, we require field maps, soil tests, uh, manure tests. We, we need to know basically full scale uh, what, what is your risk for taking manure to a particular field. And that's generally based off of phosphorus levels in the soil. Uh, but also we need to know setbacks um, and any other sensitive areas that that field might, might have. Uh, application rate limitations, again, I said before, uh, phosphorus is generally our, our limiting factor. Um, in, in some cases, nitrogen can become a limiting factor. It all depends on time of year method of application for that nitrogen. But I would, again, I would say nine times out of 10 or even higher, phosphorus is our limiting factor with, with these nutrient management plans and with, with manure application. Um, in any case, you know, phosphate application can exceed 250 pounds per acre. And from a liquid perspective, they cannot apply over 13,500 gallons per acre per one shot within a 24 hour period if that field has tile. So those are, those are the three primary uh, rate limitations that we see for, for manure application. Again, this is just kind of a list of operating records. It, it, again, with, with manure, manure management plan, you're, you have records with manure. Insect and rodent control plan, you're gonna have records associated with that. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a given. But the one thing I wanted to cover is annual groundwater, groundwater monitoring. Some facilities, um, or some structures at facilities will require groundwater monitoring as an added engineer control, where we are looking at the aquifer or uh, a sensitive layer underneath that structure. Uh, for example, uh, we have a, a, a hog facility recently built in Fulton County where, where it was kind of built over um, a, a large swath of sand, about 11 feet over it. And that facility didn't have groundwater monitoring, but we did require additional engineering controls like waterproof concrete, uh, PVC liner around that tank, around the pit. So there are uh, things that, that they have to address if the geology is not sufficient at the site. Just real quickly, this is a manure application record. This is what we require. Uh, we don't necessarily require the facilities to fill this exact form out, but this is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to information that they have to record uh, for our inspectors to review at, at every time they inspect. Okay, routine inspections. We only have four inspectors, so they can handle about 120 uh, inspections per year. That's not including any random uh, in investigations that we may have to have to conduct because of complaints or things of that nature. Uh, so every facility, again, at least one time is getting an inspection. Most facilities are getting two. Some will get more depending on compliance history or complexity of, of the uh, facility itself. 
I, I always put in here feds recommend inspection of permitted facilities so that the KFOs, MPDS permits once every five years. Again, our focus is compliance. And, and, and again, this is to me are a very vital aspect to, to ensure that. Points of emphasis when we are out at the site. Um, distribution utilization is the transferring or sale of manure. Soil tests are a big thing, manure tests, uh, nutrient application rates, you know, those three are something that we, even if a facility is doing it perfect, we're gonna hammer that home. You, you've got to have uh, up-to-date soil tests. You, you've got to have representative manure um, so that you can apply at nutrient rates that are, that are uh, economically and environmentally feasible. Um, evaluating soil conditions during, before, and after uh, application. Uh, so the, the, the list goes on in terms of points of emphasis, but these, these uh, let's see, I put 10 of them, or technically nine of them. These are the ones that we, we spend the most time on. There's some other things like weather forecasts and actual, uh, actual weather data, stockpiling uh, and, and setback issues, uh, nitrogen application rates in the summer months. We have had some um, issues with that lately in terms of uh, you know, applying too much plant available nitrogen uh, during summer months when there's no growing crop. You know, that's, that's a problem and something that we have to really pay attention to. Another aspect of our program is the complaint investigations. So um, our statute basically says, if it's a written complaint, you have to investigate. If it's an oral complaint, you do not, well, you may investigate. Our policy is that we are investigating every single complaint that we get, no matter how trivial we think it is. We, we have a responsibility to ensure that whatever is going on out at that site or at the manure application site, that we can assess situation, make sure there's no environmental issues and there's no issues to, to the neighbors. Um, generally, with when there comes to complaints, we are going to have a, a report and we're going to notify all of our uh, sister agencies, if you will. Ohio EPA, we work very closely with. Uh, ODA's uh, Division of Soil and Water Conservation, we work very closely with and any of the uh, local soil and water conservation districts we work closely with on, on those complaints, sometimes um, working on, on them together. If there are valid complaints, we will meet with the facility to correct those issues, uh, and there could potentially be enforcement. Um, enforcement is, is uh, you know, a part of regulating any type of, of entity. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a part of uh, making sure that, that compliance is, is continual uh, through the operation of that facility, depending on the owner, operator, whoever. Okay, so from 2005, and I'll, let me skip forward to this. So our program became, um, I'd say we were fully operating by 2005. Uh, and you can see at the bottom here, we had 93 complaints in that year, 96 complaints the following year but they progressively started going down. And a lot of that is mainly because of implementation of insect and rodent control plans. You can see that the layer facilities have a, uh, a very high rate of complaints early on and it started to tail off. Um, again, I give a lot of credit to our inspectors at that time and, and the implementation of the program. And you saw, you can see that in 2013, we dropped all the way down from 93 in 2005 to 17 in 2013. What happened in 2014? Toledo water crisis. So since then, our complaints have gone back up and they are more now associated, not from insects or facility-based complaints. They are more complaints uh, in the surrounding areas for manure application primarily. The public is more keen on uh, nutrient uh, management, manure management. And so uh, over the past, well, from 2016 to 2020, I don't have uh, 2021 data up here, but uh, our complaints have gone from 58 to 34. I'd say 2020 is kind of an anomaly, given that was a, a COVID year. Um, we had a lot of inquiries, but we, we didn't have as many complaints. And so instead of documenting them, we're going back and documenting them at, uh, for this presentation anyway, per species, we, we look at water quality versus non-water quality. Are, you know, are they valid? Are they not valid? And, and you can see it's, it's about, you know, 50-50 in some years, like 2017, which was a rough year when it came to manure application. We had several, uh, several issues that we had to deal with. Uh, but you can see that they're, they're most of the time, almost most of the time, I should say, 
that those water quality complaints are valid. Uh, that this number over here, 48.7%, we, we've determined it's valid, meaning we had to issue some sort of enforcement or we had a corrective action that we needed to process that we needed to go through. Touched on enforcement a little bit. I will say here, these top, these four right here are all division specific. So we will, we can initiate those without any involvement uh, really from administration or any other type of uh, entity like the Ohio Attorney General. Uh, the director's orders, uh, are more as a um, uh, something that would come down from either the director or in conjunction with the uh, attorney general. Uh, that's for the more severe penalties. Um, and, and like I said, we, we, we try to avoid working with the attorney general if we can, uh, but in some cases we can't avoid it. If, if a facility wants to dispute any type of enforcement that we would bring up against them, uh, then we automatically will uh, uh, use the services of the Ohio attorney general. Okay, certified livestock manager uh, is the last portion, I believe, of, of my presentation and, and really the, the other part of our division. Anybody that land applies, transports, uh, sells essentially uh, 4,500 dry tons or 25 million gallons per year uh, of manure, they, they have to be a CLM in the state of Ohio, certified livestock manager. Um, CLMs are regulated as uh, very similarly to what permitted facilities are regulated. They have to follow the same nutrient uh, application rate restrictions. They, they have to uh, um, follow the same setback restrictions, things of that nature, and, and we regulate them as such. Uh, also, uh, you know, this is a program that allows us to provide training opportunities. You know, manure application is becoming more and more professional. Uh, we, we need trained individuals. And, uh, and so we, we offer at least 10 hours of, of training every single year uh, Ohio State does a fantastic job of providing training opportunities. Extension offices provide fantastic training opportunities. And, and, and so though that is a focus of the CLM program, it's also uh, there to ensure that manure is being managed and applied appropriately. Okay, and that's, uh, that's it. I think I got it within 20 minutes. Any questions? Yes, yes, we are big, big, big. We know it's controversial. You know, we, we have uh, uh, nutrient pressure and, and permitting farm. But here's the bottom line. If we receive a permit application and it is compliant with our, our laws and our rules, it's, it's going to be permitted. Um, you know, if, if I were to deny, just arbitrarily deny a permit and, and it met everything, I, we'd lose that in a heartbeat. We, we'd get appealed to death and then we, we would lose that case. So um, I'm not trying to excuse that aspect. I'm just saying if, if we have a permit application and it is compliant with law, we are, we are going to permit it. Any other questions? Yes. As, uh, animal living conditions? Most, most, for most facilities, yes. I will say we probably haven't not consistently been in a hog barn for uh, almost a decade now, uh, for whatever reason, PERS or, or, or PD virus. But uh, bottom line is we are always inspecting around the facility. Uh, most of the time with poultry operations, we are going inside unless it's a broiler facility. Um, but we, we aren't, the, our focus is more on the actual management of manure. I, 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 I may have downplayed that a little bit, but really everything that we are involved with is, is, is the manure, is really where we're spending most of our time.